which is uh, the Casino uh, Cassini mission, this is the mission to Saturn, where her focus is tight. Uh, also a very interesting place. And we thrilled to hear about that today. I'm not going to go through the late the uh, academic introduction that I did this afternoon, but I do want to point out three facts. One, she's written over 100 scientific papers, and at the same time, she's written seven books on volcanoes, volcanic processes. And some of them had magical titles like alien volcanoes or alien seas. And three of her books have had introductions by Sally Ride, America's first woman in space, Arthur Clarke, the author of the 2001 Space Odyssey, and James Kevin. She has, I think, one of the most exciting medals that she's been awarded. The American Astronomical Society's Carl Sagan Medal for Excellence in Communication. The Thomas Medal of the Explorer's Award, Wings of Women of Discovery. <coughs> the Latinos in Science Medal for Mexico. The 1997 Woman of the Year in Science and Technology by Jones Television. And I also, very, very importantly, NASA's Exceptional Service Medal in 2007. So it's really thrilling to have those of them as take us to Jupiter and hopefully return us safe. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, all for coming. Uh, it's really uh, delightful to be here. It's my first time in Oklahoma, and uh, I trust it won't be the last. Uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, the uh, uh, mission Galileo. Uh, this was my first flight project, and uh, you know, actually I'm now working on Cassini, which is only my second. Those of us who work in the outer solar system tend to stay on missions for a long time because the missions are quite long uh, if you're going to the outer solar system. Uh, and I would just like to say that uh, the, the Guinness Book of, uh, uh, you know, World Records book, uh, that happened because people used to joke with me, oh, you discovered all those volcanoes you used to, you, you should be in the Guinness Book of World Records. And I got a postdoc from England who heard that uh, and uh, he said, you know, I actually have a friend who works for Guinness. Uh, and uh, not only that, but this friend uh, started doing a PhD uh, in planetary geology on Io. And uh, so I should tell my friend about you. And you know, sure enough, they went through a series of you know, investigations. They wanted my papers and uh, uh, you know, so I ended up there. And uh, my, uh, my son was then about 10 years old and he was really thrilled. <laughs> So uh, um, anyway, uh, I came to J JPL in 1989, and uh, I uh, got to know uh, people who were working on the Galileo project, uh, uh, and um, you know, particularly with one of the instruments, the near infrared mapping spectrometer, and uh, I ended up uh, working on the mission, which was an incredible time of my career. So um, uh, we, we tend to call this uh, four moons of Jupiter. Um, this is a composite image, uh, uh, you know, not all taken at the same time, but you know, there is Jupiter and then Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto uh, images taken by the Galileo mission. And um, uh, we tend to call this uh, four uh, moons the Galilean satellites or, or, or the worlds of Galileo. Uh, and I'm going to explain why. But before uh, the Galileo projects, there was Voyager very uh, successful mission that uh, uh, got to Jupiter in 1979. Um, and uh, uh, the Project Galileo was actually uh, starting to be, uh, started to be planned before even Voyager got there. But uh, the uh, Galileo was designed to investigate uh, three different aspects of the Jupiter system. Uh, the uh, uh, Jupiter's atmosphere, the uh, uh, chemical composition, and 
physical state of the atmosphere. Uh, Jupiter has an enormous uh, magnetosphere around it, uh, so you know, it was a second working group uh, of scientists to uh, study the magnetosphere. And uh, then the uh, satellites. So as a planetary geologist, I obviously fit here um, uh, the, to uh, study the um, chemical composition and physical state uh, of the Jovian satellites, in particular these uh, four moons. And these four moons were discovered by uh, Galileo in 1610. Uh, uh, during, uh, he first saw them during the night of January 7th to January 8th. And he thought they were stars, and, um, um, and uh, uh, he thought he had discovered the stars that he named the magician stars after his uh, sponsors. Uh, there was no sort of National Science Foundation or uh, NASA in those days, so the, the rich families actually supported the scientists. And, um, but the next night, he actually realized that they had moved, so they were not stars at all. And, um, you know, actually, I like that it was the night of January 8 that he found out that Io was not a star, because that's my birthday, so it's very <laughs> appropriate. <laughs> Um, and uh, soon after that, they, uh, this four moon started to be referred to as the Galilean satellites. But he also found out that this, these uh, uh, m stars or moons uh, orbited Jupiter. And, uh, um, you know, and that uh, was not the accepted view of the solar system at the time, which had everything uh, um, uh, revolving around the Earth. Um, so, you know, there was... Um, uh, you know, he supported the theory of uh, Copernicus that um, the Earth was not the center of the universe. It got him into some trouble with the church that uh, other people can talk about much better than I can. Um, but uh, finally, in 1992, uh, Galileo was pardoned by, um, you know, Pope uh, John Paul II. And in fact, our Galileo project manager and um, project scientists were amongst the people who went to the Vatican and met with the Pope. Um, so I suppose it's better late than never. <laughs> so this is uh, an artist's impression of uh, the Galileo spacecraft and what it should have looked like. Um, uh, it, in, in the end, it didn't quite look like that. Well, here is it flying by the volcanic moon of, of Jupiter. So, um, uh, you know, we thought we were going to have this uh, mission that returned a lot of data. Uh, but there was a problem, and this uh, antenna, um, the major communications antenna, didn't open. It got stuck. So we had to use a much smaller antenna, and our data rate got really low. And, um, um, uh, and that was happened while Galileo was already in flight, uh, because the antenna was supposed to deploy uh, during flight. And that was exactly the time when I was employed uh, by the Galileo project. And they said, well, um, we thought we were going to have lots of observations, but uh, in fact, we're not going to be able to have many. So, you know, for the infrared instrument, you go and figure out uh, with a very small data rate what's the best science to do. So it was actually a great opportunity for me. Um, but, um, uh, and, and in the end, it was amazing that although we didn't get a lot of observations with Galileo, we, some of us are still working on um, uh, those observations. You know, so uh, they were enough. <laughs> uh, so the uh, history of the mission, it actually started to be planned in the, in the mid-1970s as a Jupiter orbiter and probe uh, study. And then in 1977, and that was before Voyager got to Jupiter in 1979, it was, the mission was approved. And uh, the planned launch was in 1982, but Galileo turned out to be a very complex spacecraft, so there were uh, some uh, design delays. And finally, it was, uh, you know, the, the launch was planned for 1986 as a shuttle launch. That is, the shuttle would carry it up, and then it would launch uh, from uh, the shuttle. Uh, but something happened in 1986 um, that some of you may remember. Challenger exploded. So uh, the Galileo, the spacecraft, was already at the Cape. It had to be brought back. Uh, there were you know, further delays, uh, and it was finally launched in 1989. Um, so um, you know, uh, Galileo was a, a, a very complex spacecraft because 
uh, in, if you're into engineering, it combined the features of uh, two uh, types of spacecraft, one an axis, three axis stabilized spacecraft that instruments that do remote sensing like the camera really like, but also a spinning spacecraft that um, instruments like the magnetometer you have here, long magnetometer boom like because they can sweep uh, around. And that design proved to be quite difficult. One of my colleagues said that um, there were actually over a hundred versions of the design of the spacecraft. Uh, so it was quite a technical challenge that um, uh, caused uh, some of the uh, delays. Um, you know, Galileo had um, uh, you know, 12 uh, main uh, experiments on the uh, main spacecraft, and um, uh, it also had a, uh, a probe to be uh, deployed into Jupiter's atmosphere. Uh, so as I said, uh, this is an artist concept of the uh, shuttle launch. Uh, you know, so here you got the shuttle and here is the spacecraft being launched with the antenna uh, closed. Uh, and that's the antenna that was supposed to open like an umbrella, but it, it, it didn't. It seems that some pins uh, made it get stuck, so it only opened part uh, of the way. Now that uh, uh, caused, the, and the Challenger um, disaster caused a, a, a big problem because um, if Galileo had launched in time in 1989, it would have been able to go directly from Earth to Jupiter. And this is a schematic of the solar system, the, 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 the planets, um, you know, our, our real images, of course, the distances are not. Uh, but so uh, uh, Galileo had a launch window uh, that, uh, uh, so it could be launched directly from Earth to Jupiter. Uh, but because of the delay uh, with the shuttle, uh, it lost that launch window. So it could no longer uh, go direct. And also there were some new uh, safety considerations for a shuttle launch. So the booster rockets um, that the spacecraft had to use to get it on its way uh, were actually had to be uh, less powerful. Uh, so that created a, a real problem, and, uh, and, and for a time, it, it, there, there was even apparently some talk that Galileo was going to go to the Smithsonian because it couldn't actually get to Jupiter. But um, we have the best navigation you know, uh, uh, engineers in the world, the JPL trajectory uh, designers, and, um, uh, and they uh, came up uh, with a, a very clever way of um, uh, getting to Jupiter. Uh, in fact, it's said that the uh, uh, main guy uh, working on that at the time was called Roger Deal, uh, was, um, uh, started talking trajectories in his sleep. And, um, and, and in the one, one night he started talking about Venus and um, you know, I guess his wife, if you're married to one of those guys, you think that's quite normal, you know? <laughs> <laughs> talking about Venus. <laughs> And uh, in, a, in what he figured out, this looks like a complicated diagram, but you know, it isn't, is that um, uh, it, uh, we had known for a long time about gravity assist, that you can use uh, you know, a, a planet's uh, gravitational uh, pull to do a maneuver called a, a swing by or a slingshot maneuver that you, if you do it right, you can increase the velocity of the spacecraft as you go around the planet and as it comes out of the other side, uh, it will have a higher velocity. So what he figured out is that you could launch the wrong way, go towards Venus um, uh, instead of going towards the outer solar system, because in fact Mars is too small to provide a, a gravity assist. Um, so uh, uh, this new trajectory called uh, VEGA, V-E-E-G-A, uh, was uh, designed. Um, so uh, the Galileo launched, it did a Venus swing by in February of um, um, 1990, and then it used the Earth twice uh, to do gravity assist because the Earth is also big. Um, so it flew by the Earth uh, twice in 1990 and 1992. The first time, I'm sorry, it keeps doing that. Uh, it got just far enough to get to the asteroid belt uh, and we got to this asteroid here called Gaspar. Uh, and, uh, and then we came back and did another Earth uh, swing by 
uh, and that uh, gave the spacecraft enough energy uh, to uh, get to Jupiter. And it went again via the asteroid belt and, uh, uh, and did another flyby of another asteroid called Ida. And no asteroid flybys had been done before. Um, so this was actually extra uh, bonus uh, science. And finally, we got to Jupiter in the, uh, 1995. Uh, so this was the, the shuttle, uh, uh, shuttle launch, uh, Atlantis, uh, and, um, uh, and then the journey um, uh, going by Venus uh, in uh, 1990, uh, then uh, two flybys, you know, uh, asteroid uh, belt encounter around April of 1991 is when the antenna was supposed to open and, uh, and it didn't, uh, but um, uh, you know, we still managed to do a lot of science, even with this um, crippled spacecraft. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had other problems, you know, there was a, a, a Galileo had on, on board uh, a tape recorder uh, to, uh, so we could record the observations and then uh, play them back uh, to Earth. And uh, that had an anomaly as well um, in 1995, just as we were approaching um, uh, Jupiter. Uh, but, you know, that was also figured out. There was a part of the tape recorder we couldn't use. But the fact that the high gain antenna didn't open uh, meant that uh, we had to reprogram the instruments while the spacecraft was flying. Uh, so, for example, for the instrument I was working on, the near-infrared mapping spectrometer, um, uh, we had to uh, reprogram the instrument so that we could play back selected wavelengths. There was uh, image uh, compression that hadn't been planned uh, before that had to be done uh, on board uh, to actually uh, return data. And uh, uh, so it was uh, quite a, you know, quite an effort that, and, um, and the uh, spacecraft uh, uh, still used assembly language. I don't know if anyone here ever used assembly language, but, um, you know, they had to find some engineers at JPL who could still program in that language. <laughs> but um, uh, also this um, Venus flyby gave us an opportunity to test out the instruments and do some science. And this is um, um, uh, with NIMS, the Near Infrared Mapping Spectrometer, the instrument I worked with. Um, uh, this was a night side map of uh, uh, the uh, lower levels of the atmosphere uh, at 2.3 microns. The colors are fake. You notice here, um, you know, for example, the, oh, I'm sorry, it keeps doing this. Um, uh, when I try to use the mouse, uh, the, um, the clouds uh, near the polar regions are stretched out. That's because the, the winds uh, are actually higher at those uh, latitudes. At the high uh, latitudes, the winds are over 150 miles an hour. Um, so, uh, you know, NIMS was uh, able to do quite a lot of mapping. Uh, of the atmosphere uh, of, uh, of Venus. And so this was bonus science that uh, we had not expected. Galileo also flew by the Earth and the Moon. Uh, so uh, uh, this is uh, an image of one of the Moon flybys. And um, it actually used um, the um, uh, camera and some of the filters on the camera to uh, uh, get some compositional maps. And it even identified a new uh, lunar basin that is a big impact feature uh, in the, um, uh, near the South Pole, uh, the Aitken Basin. Uh, it was suspected that it existed, but it, it confirmed the existence because of the uh, image and the compositional map it took. And uh, this is actually the largest impact uh, basin in the, in the solar system. And um, uh, even the uh, flybys uh, of the Earth, this was actually the um, uh, uh, first thing I, uh, I worked on was on the uh, second uh, flyby. And um, uh, it obtained some really beautiful views of the Earth. Um, and, um, uh, and it flew by uh, not all that far, you know, like uh, 960 kilometers the first time and only 303 kilometers the second time. Um, uh, but a really interesting aspect of this is that Galileo was the first interplanetary spacecraft to visit Earth. So, um, you know, you might start thinking, well, what if uh, in some alien civilization had sent the spacecraft to fly, do a couple flybys of Earth and, um, you know, fairly close? 
and Carl Sagan was on our team, and, uh, and he came up with this really good idea. Uh, and that's uh, the paper <laughs> that they came up. And, and it's really a fascinating paper. He said, okay, let's just take the data from the spacecraft and let's see if we can find uh, life on Earth. Um, you know, the uh, principal investigator of NIMS, Robert Carlson, who was my boss at the time, was uh, on this paper. And in fact, uh, it turns out that evidence for life was actually hard to find. They, they did find that uh, the Earth got, uh, uh, you know, this uh, gas is oxygen uh, atmosphere. So if the aliens were, you know, oxygen breathing, you know, uh, aliens, then they could say, well, you know, this is a habitable planet, you know, and it's got water. And they uh, found this, um, uh, this mysterious thing, the pigment that was um, uh, green, and it turns out to be chlorophyll, which is not something that people might be expecting to find in a compositional map. Um, they found that uh, uh, the Earth, uh, the atmospheric methane was in extreme thermodynamic equilibrium, meaning that there was a lot more methane in the atmosphere than they might have expected. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of my friends said, well, maybe the aliens would have thought that the Earth was inhabited by very large creatures that, you know, passed a lot of methane. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you kind of wonder, maybe that's why they haven't visited, you know. <laughs> it's a, uh, and the only um, uh, real evidence for intelligent life came from the plasma wave instrument. Uh, that, uh, you know, detected um, uh, uh, pulsed and amplitude uh, modu modulated radio transmissions. And uh, uh, we got images of Australia at like one kilometer per pixel, but didn't show any signs of civilization, you know. <laughs> there isn't a lot of civilization in Australia, <laughs> unless you look at really the right place. So this was, uh, you know, I mean, to my mind, this was one of the most fascinating experiments that uh, we did uh, with Galileo. Um, then next, we went to the asteroid belt, and uh, uh, this was the first ever close flyby of an asteroid, you know, the um, um, asteroid um, uh, Gaspar. Um, I always forget um, how uh, large this asteroid is, but it's like, um, you know, tens of, uh, of kilometers. It's about 20 kilometers in the longest dimension. Um, and then, you know, we came back to Earth, and then the second asteroid flyby was even more interesting uh, because we found a moon. Uh, this asteroid, um, Ida, uh, which is nearly 60 kilometers in its longest dimension, actually has a moon. And, um, um, and uh, you know, the first uh, images was like the, the camera team thought they saw something weird, and, uh, and with the infrared instrument, we saw something weird. And, um, um, and we started talking to each other. It's like, mm, I see something weird, you know, off the, the main asteroid. Oh, I see something weird too. And, uh, and it turned out that that was the confirmation. Both instruments had uh, uh, detected this moon. Uh, and um, uh, so these were the, you know, two uh, first uh, asteroid uh, flybys. And, uh, you know, finally we got to Jupiter. Um, you know, so we had a, a Jupiter probe that uh, went uh, into the atmosphere. Uh, it was expected to survive about 20 minutes before it was crushed uh, by the pressure. Um, but um, it survived longer than that, um, you know, over, over an hour. And, uh, you know, measured temperature, pressure, density, composition. And, uh, you know, it puzzled the atmospheric scientists for a while. You know, I'm not one of them, but um, uh, because uh, they were expecting a lot more water vapor than was actually detected. And it turned out that Galileo uh, just happened to go into a region that was particularly dry, you know, and that was uh, worked out uh, later. Um, but, you know, later on, uh, the NIMS data uh, uh, of the main spacecraft observing Jupiter found that uh, the water vapor abundance varies a lot uh, in the atmosphere. Um, so, uh, you know, and the probe also detected greater amounts of carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur than um, uh, was expected. Uh, this is not a real image, of course, it's a, an artist's impression. Detected lightning, um, strong winds, 
And um, I'm not going to talk much about Jupiter atmosphere because I want to talk about the satellites. But uh, you know, uh, the NIMS uh, experiment found some uh, interesting things, in, in, including the uh, detection of uh, ammonia clouds, which are these um, uh, things represented here in, in, in blue. Um, and uh, you know, the uh, ice. Oops, oh, sorry. Uh, the uh, um, uh, ammonia ice uh, clouds. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, but when we got to the main tour, um, December 1995 was when the probe went in and, um, and we got some uh, uh, just fields and particles data with the magnetometer and, and other instruments. Um, that was our planned, uh, we had planned only one close flyby of Io. And I had done a whole bunch of observations, you know, planning, that was my one chance to uh, get uh, observations close up. And because of the tape recorder anomaly, we went and it wasn't figured out yet, you know, what exactly was happening with the tape recorder, so we couldn't record any of those data. So the spacecraft still went through the motions, observing everything, but it was very depressing. We couldn't uh, <laughs> record any of data. But later on in the mission, luckily, we got um, the opportunity to do other close flybys of IO. So between June 1996 and December 1997, that was the prime mission. Uh, we made distant observations of Io and um, uh, close observations of Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Um, uh, then we got an extended mission because NASA thought that even with this spacecraft that didn't have the high gain antenna, we were doing such you know, good science that they, they gave us a Galileo Europa mission because Europa turned out to be so interesting, as I'll tell you. And um, so we did uh, this extended mission, and right at the end of that, we did two IO flybys. And, uh, and then, but you know, spacecraft was still working, everything was working as we were getting to the end of this first extended mission. So we got another extended mission um, uh, from um, you know, January 2000 until uh, Jupiter impact, which was in 2003, and that was the Galileo Millennium mission. And, uh, um, and actually, we had a contest uh, in the team for the name of this mission, and I won it. I know I actually named a mission probably the only time in my life, but uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, so this is a composite made of, uh, uh, in fact, with Voyager uh, images, uh, uh, Jupiter, and uh, you see here Io, and then um, uh, Europa, uh, Ganymede, and Callisto. These moons are all very different from one another and all very interesting in, uh, in, in different ways. Um, and actually, Ganymede is larger than Mercury, so it's the largest moon in the solar system. Uh, if this weren't around Jupiter, we would think of them as planets, you know, they're planetary barges. Um, uh, so, um, Io, uh, it's my favorite, of course, because you know I largely study volcanoes. So uh, it has very hot volcanoes. It has a very colorful surface, dominated by sulfur. It has no impact craters at all, and that means that it's a very young surface. Because um, uh, in general, we date planetary surfaces, but by how many craters they have, which means that the longer a surface has been exposed to impacts, the more craters it's going to have. Um, and also the larger the craters it's going to have. Um, Europa has few impact craters, you know, uh, very few, meaning that it's also a young surface. Uh, you know, and then progressing out, Ganymede uh, is uh, older and Callisto is even older. Uh, Callisto is very heavily cratered, so that, uh, you know, that, that means uh, an old surface. Callisto has a, a very large impact basin as well, uh, called Valhalla. Uh, Ganymede, um, uh, has uh, a surface that has some you know, bright parts and some older, very dark uh, parts. And in fact, the, uh, you know, this world mm -hmm. turned out so interesting that there is an European mission um, uh, called JUICE that's actually going to uh, 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 explore particularly uh, Ganymede, and, uh, and JPL is now planning a, a mission to Europa. Uh, you know, so um, uh, we're getting back to the Jupiter system with a, a number of missions. Um, so uh, the interiors of the satellites, um, uh, you know, what's particularly interesting here is Europa. 
and um, probably Ganymede as well, uh, they have uh, layers of uh, liquid water. And in fact, this was the great excitement of the mission, probably more than I.O., was the discovery that um, uh, Europa um, has a, a, a thin ice crust, or fairly thin, and uh, liquid water uh, underneath uh, this ice crust. And, um, uh, and because we also think that there is volcanism uh, on Europa, uh, that gives you two of the ingredients that you need for life, which is uh, heat and uh, water. So that became very, very exciting. So let's talk a little bit about these uh, moons. Um, Callisto is a very old surface, but if you start looking at it with higher and higher resolution, you know, uh, you know, here is from a distance, and then we start looking closer. And by the way, the um, uh, morphology, the shape, the appearance of these impact craters, you notice is quite different from uh, those of the Earth's moon. And that uh, is, uh, is because they're formed on an icy surface. So when you, uh, the uh, material you're impacting on uh, actually has an effect uh, on the morphology of the crater. Um, and, uh, and if you actually look, you know, uh, sort of even closer, there are some uh, dark, uh, smooth uh, areas and some evidence of erosion, uh, like uh, even, you know, uh, small, uh, uh, perhaps small landslides or um, erosion probably because of uh, sublimation of, um, uh, of, of uh, ice uh, from the surface. And uh, here is a false color image from the near-infrared mapping spectrometer. Uh, the blue, um, um, uh, uh, the, the, the white means more water ice and the blue less ice. Uh, so here is from a, a, an impact basin and actually at the center of the basin, more material has you know, come up, it's more recent and it's more icy. Um, Ganymede is a very interesting moon uh, with this, uh, uh, a lot of tectonics, this uh, split uh, ice crust uh, with some uh, uh, material that came up in, uh, in, in bands and some uh, dark parts which are very cratered and very old. Uh, and so you see here some of the fresher impact craters with you know, ice uh, showing up. And as I said, that's the target of uh, an European mission that's going to get there in the late 2020s. And um, the, uh, uh, the dark terrain on Ganymede uh, is, um, uh, is actually very puzzling and very hard to interpret. You know, um, I challenge you know, people to uh, actually interpret that kind of terrain, but this is actually very uh, heavily impacted terrain with some, um, you know, furrows. And this uh, region is probably several billion years old. Uh, and, um, uh, and, you know, uh, with, you know, dirty ice means silicate rock material uh, and ice. Um, Europa, as I said, that, that turned out, you know, even though I'm partial to Io, but Europa was the uh, most interesting finding of this uh, Galileo mission. Um, the, the surface, uh, these colors are exaggerated, but um, uh, this um, uh, surface is cracked, it's very young, there are very few impact craters, and in some places it looks like material from underneath uh, the crust, material that is in the subsurface ocean has actually come up uh, to the surface. Um, and this uh, ice shell uh, is uh, moving slowly over uh, an ocean, uh, of uh, liquid water. Um, these um, regions here are uh, called uh, uh, chaotic terrain, or uh, chaos regions, that's because they all sort of jumbled up. And uh, I'll show you a close up uh, of, of that. Um, now, so a uh, big puzzle about Europa is, um, is the crust uh, check or sin, uh, you know, how, um, uh, we think there, is, there are volcanoes uh, underneath this ice crust and that these uh, materials coming up. Uh, there are competing models about the thickness of the crust. I'm showing the extreme ones um, that, you know, it might be very thin. I mean, this model is not very favored at the moment, or it might be, um, you know, a relatively thick, maybe with a, a, a region of kind of a, a more slushy ice. Uh, but one of the things we want to find out uh, is uh, how uh, thick is this ice crust, because we're very interested to explore uh, the material underneath uh, in this uh, ocean that has water and also has volcanic heat. 
Mm. And um, this is one of the chaos regions called Connemara Chaos. Uh, the uh, you know, team for Europa is all uh, uh, Celtic names. Uh, and um, um, uh, so Connemara is a region in Ireland, as some of you know. Um, and this is a small region. This image is about 70 kilometers across. Um, and uh, uh, it shows some fine uh, ice particles uh, here. They're, they're colored blue. These are, enhanced colors and um, um, and they uh, but there's also a reddish brown surface um, which has been altered by by minerals and uh, we are really interested to um, uh, figure out uh, uh, what's in these uh, in these regions particularly regions where material may have come up uh, from the deep ocean and um, there was some um, some um, recent work uh, by a colleague of mine uh, Brittany Smith um, that, uh, uh, you know, and this is an artist drawing that um, some of these chaos regions might actually be a crack, crack crust over a, a, a subsurface reservoir. So even if the crust is, is thick, uh, there may be places where it's actually thinner, such as in this uh, chaos. Uh, um, uh, you know, terrains and uh, and the evidence comes from the, the surface being depressed, you know, it's like uh, it's cracked over this, uh, you know, uh, probably a, 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 a reservoir, uh, you know, of, um, uh, of water. And this would be about the size of uh, uh, Lake Ontario, you know, this region. And she's done a lot of work studying uh, lakes in Antarctica. Uh, you know, subsurface lakes uh, in Antarctica. And, uh, you know, eventually, I'm not quite sure when, but, uh, you know, these would be regions that would really like to uh, sample uh, this uh, ocean uh, underneath. Um, but the next mission uh, to, uh, to Jupiter, uh, to, well, there's actually the uh, Juno mission is on its way to Jupiter, but the next planned mission that's going to explore Europa is called the Europa Clipper mission, and then um, uh, JPL is uh, developing this mission. Uh, the uh, instruments that would go on the spacecraft were recently chosen. And, uh, um, and th the major goal is to investigate Europa as a habitable environment. So it's going to investigate the ice shell uh, and the ocean um, uh, and um, uh, what are the processes that are, are making the subsurface ice ocean uh, surface uh, exchanges and material coming up uh, to the surface from the ocean. It's going to look at the um, distribution and chemistry of um, uh, uh, key places where we think the material has come up uh, from underneath and also the material has been altered uh, by um, uh, uh, radiation from Jupiter and the uh, particles impacting on the surface. And it's going to study the geology and the formation of the surface features including sites where we think there's been recent volcanic uh, activity. And, um, um, you know, here uh, it's um, uh, going to have, um, uh, obtain a lot of uh, topography, fine-scale topography, and uh, look for signs of recent activity. I'm not going to talk too much about this because I know that my colleague uh, Bob Papalado is uh, coming up next year to actually tell you all about Europa and this mission. He's the project scientist. Um, but, um, uh, you know, uh, as I said, they also investigate the chemistry, the composition, uh, what, you know, uh, are the uh, materials uh, that, um, that are there, what are the radiation effects, because Jupiter has a, you know, a very strong magnetic field and uh, particles bombard uh, the surface. And uh, it's going to carry a, a, a sounding radar that, uh, you know, like a, a Mars mission carried, you know, this is, uh, you know, actually the Sherrod uh, uh, radar on the uh, Mars Odyssey that um, um, uh, it, uh, it's actually investigating the, uh, the polar ice uh, of Mars. Um, so, uh, you know, particularly should be able to detect regions, uh, you know, underneath those chaotic regions if there is really a thin ice crust and, and material underneath that. And uh, what I think is most fascinating is that um, it's going to do the reconnaissance for a future lander. And uh, uh, there are also studies going on uh, at JPL about uh, a, a, an Europa lander. Um, and uh, landing on Europa is going to be quite challenging because um, 
you know, normally with landing a spacecraft, you want somewhere that's quite smooth and it's not going to have pointy rocks. But at the same time, you want somewhere that's very interesting. Uh, so it, it, it's, quite, um, uh, it, it's quite a sturgy and a, a prolonged sturgy to uh, uh, you know, work out somewhere that is safe to land and at the same time is really interesting and has things that you want to measure. Um, uh, the Europa mission is also uh, um, planning to use a Vega trajectory, so the trajectory that was worked out for Galileo, um, that's what um, uh, the Europa mission will probably uh, launch. This is all baseline because you know it's uh, still a few years uh, in the future, uh, so some changes uh, might happen. But the, the, the launches, uh, a nominal launches around 2021, 22, and um, uh, so to arrive at Jupiter at the, um, the uh, towards the end of the uh, you know, 2020s. Now we go to Io, my favorite moon. Uh, it's a, a very weird place because you look at it. The uh, uh, first thing planetary geologists notice is that it doesn't have any impact craters. Second, what's, what are all those colors on the surface? Uh, it said that um, when the Voyager spacecraft obtained the first uh, uh, you know, uh, high resolution uh, images of Io, and um, the um, uh, imaging team lead uh, uh, looked at one of the images and said, what's that? It looks like a pizza. Uh, so um, <laughs> like, where have we come to? So um, it became nicknamed the Pizza Moon. Um, and and uh, yeah, you know, it's got the, uh, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the black parts there, could be the olives and, the, and so on. But the reason it has this colorful surface is that it's all dominated by uh, sulfur products, particularly, uh, it's a lot of sulfur dioxide really it's all over the surface. Um, except these very dark parts, and uh, those are the parts I like because those are the active volcanoes. Um, uh, there is so much uh, sulfur dioxide on Io being emitted by uh, plumes and, uh, uh, that, you know, if a, uh, if a volcano stops erupting and is there for a while, it, sulfur dioxide starts to uh, condense down on it, and so that surface becomes lighter. But the, 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 the very dark parts are um, uh, still uh, where, the, uh, the, where the volcanoes are hot. Um, and um, um, it's also got some very red parts, uh, and we think that's S4, sulfur 4. And uh, uh, so, you know, a lot of uh, uh, interesting uh, different chemistry. Uh, on this moon. Now, why is Io volcanically active? Io is about the size of the Earth's moon, so you know you might think logically that uh, it should have cooled uh, long ago. But in fact, the discovery of active volcanism on Io uh, was confirmed by um, Voyager, the Voyager spacecraft, uh, when it got there in '79. But it was predicted, you know, by some uh, you know very clever guys who studied the orbit of Io and uh, the orbits of um, uh, the Galilean satellites and um, um, you know, figured out uh, that, um, um, that there would be a massive heating of Io uh, caused by the fact that uh, you know, Jupiter has a very uh, strong gravitational field, so Io has a tidal bulge that if the other moons weren't there, this tidal bulge would face Jupiter would go around Jupiter, wouldn't have any volcanism at all. But the other moons, which are smaller but closer to Io, uh, you know, they are uh, they're all locked in synchronous rotation, so they actually pull that bulge uh, towards them. And, and it's just that uh, a movement of the crust that actually causes heating and uh, causes active volcanoes. And uh, this was really the first time that we actually understood that tidal heating uh, could cause active volcanism. And, and it's, this is also the effect that Europa has and why we think there are still volcanoes uh, under that uh, ocean. But Europa uh, suffers it less uh, than Io. And um, they actually said this. Uh, this was two weeks before the Voyager spacecraft uh, got to Jupiter. Their paper says one might speculate that widespread and recurrent surface volcanism uh, would occur. And I think that's the best prediction I have ever seen in a science paper. And, um, and this was really key to understanding uh, you know, uh, broadening our perspective of planetary volcanism uh, because uh, you have 
tidal heating, you can have volcanism because of tidal heating. Uh, you don't need to have a large planet. Uh, you don't need uh, plate tectonics. So um, the uh, volcanism was actually really discovered, nailed down, um, not by the scientists, but by a um, navigation engineer uh, who became quite famous, called Linda Morabito, um, that um, um, uh, we use the cameras on spacecraft often to help um, navigation. So she was taking a navigation image, and that's why it's not a particularly pretty image. It was just a, you know, kind of a, a, a throwaway. <laughs> and, uh, and she noticed these two um, uh, weird things, you know, uh, which turned out to be volcanic plumes. But um, uh, this is the Terminator, the, uh, that's nighttime, daytime. The top of another plume is being illuminated by sunlight. Um, and this pellet plume is about 300 kilometers high. Um, and um, uh, so the uh, scientists on the imaging team had already figured out that there were, the surface was young. Uh, there was uh, likely recent volcanism, but this really nailed it, that volcanism was happening right then. Um, so uh, they planned some of observations uh, of these plumes and in fact um, uh, ended up uh, detecting sulfur dioxide uh, over one of these plumes and also uh, enhanced thermal emission. So there was no doubt that um, volcanism was happening and it was quite spectacular um, that a plume it's from a volcano called Loki. That's also a Voyager image, and, um, and that's about 100 kilometers high. Well, you know, you might ask why this plume is so high. Well, a, a, a friend of mine actually, uh, you know, uh, calculated that if Old Faithful was on high, it would be about 20 kilometers high. Um, and that is, uh, 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 well, gravity is lower, but the main effect is a, vac is a near vacuum. It's a very, very uh, tenuous atmosphere, so these plumes are just erupting and going supersonic, essentially. And uh, with this now a Galileo image, we also detected a number of uh, plumes. Uh, this was one we had not seen before called Pilan, and it was a, a major uh, eruption. Actually, this was uh, initially, one of the volcanoes I found to have thermal emission, uh, and it was just a, a you know a little caldera there. Didn't, didn't seem to be very important. And then uh, in 1997, it had a major eruption, and uh, this is a, a shadow of another plume called Prometheus. And then when that major eruption happened, uh, this volcano had a, a, a plume, and uh, and that was the uh, 1997 eruption, which we call the Black Eye. So the you know unsuspecting little volcano here that you know I, I had detected that it was um, uh, you know it was active, but you know just seemed to be a you know a little thing here on the side of a a, a, a much more important volcano uh, called Pele. This is a ring formed by one of these plume deposits. Uh, quite spectacular is about a thousand kilometers uh, in diameter. The volcano is right in the middle here, uh, but it's erupting this uh, enormous plume, which was the one that Linda Morabito found uh, on the limb that erupts quite often. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, and then in 1997, this uh, volcano Pilan just decided to have a massive oops, eruption, and uh, um, it. Um, uh, the uh, size of that deposit, uh, according to one of my colleagues from Arizona, uh, is the size of Arizona, you know. So I uh, would have this major eruption would cover the whole of Arizona. Uh, and uh, so uh, Io, uh, I refer to it as a volcanologist's paradise because all these volcanoes are going off and it's wonderful to study them, but it's a cartographer's worst, worst nightmare because you make a map and then you've got to change it. It changes. <laughs> Uh, so the uh, USGS probably doesn't like IO very much. <laughs> uh, now with uh, ArcGIS is easy because you can just have layers and well, it was like this one day, but then it, it was something else. So this was one of my um, observations, distant observations of IO. Uh, so that's you know essentially uh, you know what I did a lot of was go through all these observations pixel by pixel, and uh, and um, and see where the um, uh, particularly at wavelengths of like four or five microns uh, where uh, there was enhanced term emission and that's how we uh, found the volcanoes. Um, so there are you know, quite a few uh, you know, vol volcanoes in this observation, but I marked here this uh, 
old image new, new, and uh, this one, this two were also new. Um, uh, so in the beginning, it was, um, yeah, it was quite exciting. We would get one of these uh, infrared images and, uh, you know, and I was you know, al always there doing all this pixel comparison you know, and, uh, uh, and um, you know, finding all these volcanoes. Um, now, the, uh, something that turned out very interesting was the, uh, when we started, uh, you, you can use, of course, infrared data and, uh, at various wavelengths to uh, uh, work out the temperature uh, of the lavas. And, um, and temperature, the, the, the melting temperature of a particular lava gives you a good handle on the composition. Uh, so we started, um, uh, you know, doing, uh, you know, fits, temperature fits to um, uh, this very spectra and uh, working out temperatures. Now, uh, one thing that makes it difficult, particularly with observations from far away, um, this resolution is about, I um, think, 250 at 241 kilometers per pixel. The advantage of not having a lot of observations is that I really know them, you know, I still remember all of them. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, so we, we uh, but when you're observing, uh, you know, lava even on Earth uh, from a distance, um, lava cools very quickly. And, uh, you know, just to show you, uh, this is an image of, uh, this is me on Hawaii and the lava I'm standing on is uh, probably a you know, was moving a few hours ago. And, um, and you can see here uh, that, you know, the red, oops, the, the red is where, uh, you know, it's breaking up. There's a little, what we call, toes of lava. Uh, they're just breaking up. And um, in fact, it, it's possible to walk over moving lava. Uh, you know, it's, um, uh, if your boots start to smell, you got to walk faster, but, you know, <laughs> it's, um, it's possible. So that's because the lava cools so quickly and it forms a, a cool crust that's very insulating. But when you're trying to figure out the eruption temperature, well, even that red there has already cooled some. Uh, you know, as soon as it's exposed, it, it cools uh, uh, very quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, most of our lava flow field is actually dominated by these uh, cooler regions. Uh, so when we're, you know, looking with remote sensing, it's always like a, a minimum temperature. Um, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, and we actually, with, you know, if we go back here a sec, uh, with this eruption, uh, we actually found that the temperatures were, you know, really high. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, basalts on Earth, which are the hottest lavas we have on Earth these days, uh, uh, you know, they uh, erupt around 1,200 Celsius, 1,250. And, uh, uh, and when we started working out the temperature on this eruption, which was a very violent eruption and disrupted a lot of crust, it was actually higher than that. Um, and, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, we're not sure yet, but this opened up a possibility that these lavas might be what we call ultramafic uh, on Earth. And these are uh, lavas that are very primitive, um, and, uh, and they, uh, they were erupted on Earth uh, mostly billions of years ago. Um, and, uh, uh, but it, it's been quite tricky to really uh, determine, um, uh, you know, accurately the temperature of this lava. So we still don't know if they are basaltic or if they are ultramafic. Uh, but um, they are either very hot basalts that didn't cool much or they are uh, ultramafic. Um, and um, uh, so we did this distance of uh, observations until 1999. And then, uh, you know, um, as we got towards the end of the first extended missions, the, um, the engineers let us do a couple of close flybys of Io. Now, um, ma I mentioned before that Jupiter has a very high radiation environment, and Io is very affected by it. So, the, you know, you go close to Io and your spacecraft gets actually uh, a little dose of radiation that would kill you in a day. Um, you know, so it's not very good for spacecraft, it's not very good for instruments. Um, so they wanted to avoid us uh, going, you know, very close. Uh, but, um, you know, towards the end of the first extended mission, they say, okay, you know, you can do a couple of um, IO flybys. And, uh, and, and, and in fact, we planned three. And uh, uh, you know, some of the engineers were like, you know, your instruments are going to fry. But they didn't, and in fact, we were able to, uh, you know, uh, get um, uh, get other IO flybys in August and October um, 
of, uh, uh, of 2001, and even in January uh, 2002 that we had uh, stopped using the um, remote sensing instruments by then, but the spacecraft survived a lot, a lot of radiation. So just to compare uh, the infrared data that, uh, you know, as I said before, I had observations like this at, um, you know, about 250 kilometers per pixel, but as we got closer, um, you know, we actually could get uh, small regions because our data rate wasn't very high, uh, uh, but at, um, uh, you know, much higher uh, resolution. So more volcanoes started popping up and, um, um, you know, um, uh, it's, um, uh, and actually the, the camera detected some uh, active volcanoes as well. And so it, in total was like 104 were detected by Galileo. And um, uh, we also had a photopolarimeter, a radiometer that had longer uh, wavelengths. So the, the, the closer we looked, the more volcanoes we found. And, uh, you know, and that was, uh, uh, it was very frustrating not to get the whole globe at, um, you know, at least like those observations are around 50 kilometers per pixel, but we had to choose particular regions. So, you know, um, uh, we chose uh, a, a region that we thought we understood something about of this volcano called Prometheus. Uh, and um, so it's likely that Io has many more uh, active volcanoes that we haven't detected yet. It has some regions with um, uh, a very colorful character um, uh, because, you know, uh, sulfur uh, actually, depending on the impurities you have, on the composition can take many uh, different colors. Uh, this is a particularly interesting one. Uh, it's very green. Uh, one of my colleagues referred to those regions as the, the, the golf courses of Iowa. Um, and, uh, and this uh, white region here is actually a very, you know, pure um, uh, sulfur dioxide um, uh, deposit, uh, which also turned out quite interesting, and we think it might actually have, uh, uh, you know, come up and flowed. Um, that's another Golf course, uh, it's another volcano. Uh, so in the interior of the caldera, it's very green. There is uh, a sulfur here from a plume uh, that is, um, is red. And then the active regions are actually these um, uh, very uh, dark, uh, generally the darker the regions, you know, the more of a chance you have that is either active or very recently active. Um, and uh, this is one of my favorite calderas, it's called Tupan. Uh, and uh, that actually suggested the name, it's after the um, uh, Brazilian uh, nature god of thunder. It's about 70 kilometers across. And uh, you know, it has a, a region in the middle that's very cold and that's where sulfur dioxide has deposited and we could see that with the infrared as well. Uh, and then um, uh, regions that are dark, um, uh, that's where lava is active. And, uh, you know, on this side here, it looks like the, it has crusted over quite a bit, except for a few regions where lava is coming up. But the most interesting thing is that if you notice here on the edges, it's almost like someone went around it with a pen and, uh, and, and drew these dark edges. And, uh, and, and that means that um, uh, the, uh, uh, there is hot material on the edges of, uh, uh, of this caldera, uh, and um, and where you normally find this is on lava lakes, and I'll show you a picture in uh, uh, a moment. But um, first of all, I want to s uh, show you this painting um, that was uh, made by an artist, a space artist called uh, Michael Carroll. Um, and in fact, um, you know, I was just in my office one day, and I get a phone call from this guy who. I didn't know at all, and he said, um, um, uh, he's also a writer, popular science writer, and he said, I'm writing an article for an astronomy magazine, and they asked me to do a new painting. So what volcano do you suggest I paint? So we started chatting about volcanoes, and I thought, well, Tupan, you know, this really interesting caldera. So I sent him this image, I explained about in the infrared data what was hot, what was not. These flow-like features here, we think are deposits of sulfur that are coming down from the caldera. And, um, and he ended up painting this view, and he kept asking me, what would it look like if you were standing at the bottom of the caldera? And at first I have, 
I don't have any idea. You know, I don't think that way. <laughs> I look at data. <laughs> so, uh, but we had a you know a lot of interesting discussions with other IO scientists as well, and uh, even about you know the angles of those jets that uh, uh, are coming up from the side of the, the caldera, and that's his view of the interior, what the interior probably uh, looks like, and this. Um, you know, I ended up liking the painting so much, it's now hanging in my office. <laughs> and uh, this is another one of his paintings of the interior of another caldera. Um, also quite interesting, um, this is uh, probably the best um, known, uh, it's, it's the best known volcano on Io. Also the most powerful, it's called Loki. It's, a, it's the largest caldera in the solar system, about 200 kilometers across. And, um, uh, and it's got this, um, uh, we call it an island uh, in the middle that's cold. It's very much like the other one. We don't know why those cold islands um, form. Um, and um, uh, and uh, you know, just um, uh, when we looked at it in the infrared, you know, this is at about two microns and this is uh, five microns, we again noticed this hot edge. Um, now, hot edges are found on lava lakes. Um, this is a uh, a lava lake uh, in Hawaii that's mostly crusted over. But you know what happens, I told you, the crust forms very quickly. So um, the material underneath it's still molten because the crusts are very good insulator. So I I as it sloshes around a bit like scum on a pond, you start getting the edges breaking off. And so that's why the uh, uh, you know, hot material is seen around the edges. And um, this is a... Um, uh, 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 you know, a, a, a picture that um, you know uh, we got last year. I went to uh, the Vanuatu Islands. Um, in fact, with some colleagues and um, and a Brazilian TV crew, and um, uh, and we were uh, looking at this lava lake in a volcano called Ambrium that is the most vigorous lava lake uh, in the world. You know, these things really bubble up. But if you, can, if you look again at the edges, um, you know, it's got this uh, hot material all around the edges where material is breaking up. And, um, and this is one, this is all the edge of a caldera that's Ita Ali volcano in um, Ethiopia. Uh, and if we have the, uh, you know, this is going to work. Yes, um, this is from the edge of the lava lake, and you can see the crust cools, but uh, you know forms these rafts, and uh, and this right here is the edge of the caldera where the material is bumping against the walls and is is, is breaking off. Um, so this is a way that we, um, um, sorry, we interpreted uh, that a lot of these calderas on Io have lava lakes, which are actually rare on Earth. Uh, but uh, appear to be quite common on Io. Um, I'm talking about plumes again. Um, this was actually the, the largest plume ever detected on Io um, uh, from a, a, a volcano that I found on this image here. Uh, and, uh, and it was so, there was so much heat, it actually saturated uh, our instrument. Um, and uh, it was detected during one of the flybys. Um, and, um, uh, and in fact, uh, my colleague, um, Alfred McEwen on the imaging team, he had detected this plume and they were trying to figure out where it was coming from and it didn't seem to be com coming from quite any known volcanoes. Um, you know, and he asked me, you know, is there anything around uh, you know, in this particular location, you know, and I said no, and then it's like the next day I got the NIMS data and it's like, oh yeah, I know where your plume's coming from. <laughs> and it formed a new plume deposit, uh, this time white, um, probably largely sulfur dioxide. So again, another cartographer's nightmare because you know, it now looks different. And this plume was also active in 2007, the uh, last close-up that we had a file, uh, this is several images uh, in a time lapse, uh, was from the New Horizons spacecraft. The New Horizons used Jupiter as a gravity assist to get to Pluto. Um, so I collaborated with the, the, the team uh, to plan uh, the IO observations. So these plumes on IO can be very high. You know, this is the, the, the Pele plume around 250 miles and uh, you know, just a cartoon show, showing you there are some plumes that are more Frequent uh, Prometheus, for example, this plume is always active every time we look at it. 
and the uh, you know poor volcanoes on Earth are actually you know very uh, uh, <laughs> very small in comparison. Mm -hmm. Um, Io has a, an influence in the whole of the Jupiter system. This is a, a, a drawing of the Jupiter magnetosphere. Uh, you know, um, um, you know, Io. Uh, it actually delivers a, 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 a material at the rate of a ton a second, and this material, uh, you know, goes in a flux tube to uh, Jupiter, causes aurora. It also uh, uh, impacts Europa. You know, causes changes on the surface. So it's a very interesting environment. The, I think I'm running out of time, but I'm nearly at the end. Uh, the uh, Juno spacecraft is on its way now, and um, uh, it will arrive uh, Jupiter on July 4th of next year, so that's going to be a special celebration. Um, and um, it, it's, it's actually going to go into a, an elliptical polar orbit. It's not going to study the moons. Uh, it's going to study uh, uh, you know, Jupiter and uh, Jupiter's interior, in particular make measurements of the interior of the magnetic fields, and um, um, it will actually get uh, as close as 5,000 kilometers from the uh, cloud tops. Um, now, what happened to Galileo in the end? Well, we had to kill it, um, because um, Galileo discovered that uh, Europa had this habitable environment. Uh, now, we didn't know that when the spacecraft was launched, and uh, we didn't want to risk contaminating uh, uh, Europa uh, or one of the other moons uh, with this um, uh, spacecraft that hadn't really been debugged. Uh, when, we, when we go to Mars, we're much more careful about planetary protection, and I know we have someone in the audience who uh, works with that. Uh, you don't want to export uh, any um, contaminants uh, from Earth. And uh, if you just run out of propellant and leave the spacecraft around there, there's always a small chance that it could impact uh, Europa uh, or one of the other icy moons. Um, so uh, it actually, um, you know, uh, September 21st, 2003, I was already working on the Cassini mission at that time, but we had a special uh, celebration, I suppose, you know, should have been more like a wake, but we celebrated that uh, the fact that this um, spacecraft had done, you know, such good work, um, and, um, and it really was a, a spectacular mission, uh, and that's another of Michael Caro's illustration of Galileo just uh, becoming part of Jupiter. Mm. And um, so it, it really was an amazing mission uh, when you think of it, because um, it actually only returned about 30 gigabytes uh, of data, which is really not very much at all. Um, the data rate was pathetic. Um, the capacity of the tape recorder, again, was not large. And, uh, and, and it had these processors that were ancient. Um, but it survived uh, more than four times the radiation dose that it had been designed uh, to survive. Uh, it had a team of engineers that were just absolutely amazing, you know, from the you know, first troubles of the shuttle that a new trajectory had to be designed um, to uh, uh, reprogramming the instruments in flight, uh, uh, it, um, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, also the spacecraft went into what we call safing, that is, it sort of shuts itself off and calls home because of this high radiation environment around Jupiter. And there was one time when it was right during one of the IO flybys and it happened at Thanksgiving and, you know, engineering team left the Thanksgiving dinners and, you know, and came to JPL in time to recover part of the observation sequence and we still got some observations. And, uh, you know, and as I said, we're still analyzing um, um, some of these observations. There are still new things to, to, to be found, um, you know, particularly with as knowledge um, has uh, evolved. And um, uh, so it, it, it really uh, ended up being an amazing mission. We did have to plan our observations much more carefully than uh, normally we have to do with missions because you could only return you know, a few gigabytes of data. Um, so um, I um, described it in one of my books as, um, you know, normally a mission would be more like a tourist with a you know, point and shoot camera, digital camera. Oh, you know, I'll take lots of data and then I'll see which ones I like. And uh, with Galileo, we had to be like Ansel Adams. We had to really plan each observation and it had to be perfect. 
um, but I think in the end we did quite a good job. So thank you very much. There are actually some um, uh, features. Oops, I'm underneath something here. Uh, there are some features on the surface that we think, you know, are volcanic, and we see some uh, 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 material that looks like it welled up from the interior uh, uh, around some of those folds. We see some little dots that we think might have been uh, like geysers. So there are features on the surface that have been interpreted as uh, volcanic. So that's what we think is happening, and now. The Hubble, uh, w uh, w with Hubble, uh, uh, some of my colleagues have actually seen a, a plume, uh, you know, so that's been really exciting uh, result from a couple of years ago. Uh, that um, it's only been seen once, but so, know, so it's that's there. Cryovolcanism, right? Yes, that's, that's cryovolcanism, is yes. Is there a, like, thermal volcanism that's happening below the surface of the Earth? Uh, uh, well, that's actually the main thing. Uh, there, there may be a uh, deep uh, 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 in the crust. Um, but, um, uh, you know, it's what the sort of schematic there was, you know, there may, you know, actually be molten silicates uh, uh, underneath the ocean, uh, but the material that's coming to the surface uh, is actually, yeah, it will be cryovolcanism or the water-based uh, volcanism. Mm. Okay, great. Mm. Yes? Mm. Yes. Yeah. On your, your image of Io, mm. there seemed to be a younger feature uh, on the right side of it, a small white feature. Mm, and let's I'm go, go back. I which one? Or if it's an illusion. And which, I'm wondering what the surface which one? temperature would be on Io. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, it, 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 it's, it's very, you know, uh, cold on the surface, you know, around 120 Kelvin. Kelvin. Yeah, but where the volcanoes are, it's much hotter. But which, uh, which image in particular? Is it one of these? Um, or?